this session in English because we've got some English speaking uh, members who have joined us. Thank you very much for joining me uh, in this session. Hopefully you'll find it interesting. It's a bit different um, from from what we what we usually do. Uh, my 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 fascination with with vintage photography started long ago because when you start looking at images taken by people by by photographers over a hundred years ago and even more with very basic equipment one starts to wonder and think about this general idea in today's world that people who start doing photography uh, sort of feel that it's the equipment is such an important part of the, pre the practice all right granted equipment makes a difference yes but when you see what has been done before by others with the simplest of equipment um, one starts to wonder and also uh, i would like to always push my point that photography is is really the equipment is a, as part of it but it's not the bulk of it the the main the main uh, um practice is very important according to how you visualize an image how you work it even technically okay and your creativity it's again what i always say the eyes need to see the picture the brain needs to visualize the elements that the picture that you are seeing that are attracting you in the first place to take the photograph and then your technique comes in at how to bring out the best out of the scene out of the subject that you are actually um, seeing in, in your in, in front of your lens uh, so this presentation this session i try to build it up by researching and finding images which have things that we we can all learn from simple simple things that most of us are already doing because we practice not only do we practice photography but a lot of things in art and photography come from our uh, genetics from the way we've been brought up and from what's been uh, done before and what we've learned so mm -hmm. hopefully you will be able to see um, how people before us look that photography yeah. and how they took the opportunity of taking uh, the, the pictures okay so i i'm i'm more or less calling this learning from the pioneers from those people who came before us okay for example if we see this picture which is a, a traditional sepia toned picture what was sepia sepia was a chemical toner done after in the dark room after a black and white or monochrome print was produced its main aim was to achieve archival uh, quality in the in the picture it it would give much more stability to to the print not to fade not to discolor etc as time went by the actual sepia tone started becoming like sort of an artistic uh, an artistic trademark so today we come to look at sepia more as of as an artistic practice particularly when we are using photoshop at the touch of a button i can turn turn that into a sepia tone um, this picture, for example, is, is an image which for me is actually timeless. Uh, it is, uh, it has really nice lighting. It has a mood. It's not very creative. We've seen many of such pictures uh, and such studio portraits. And one thing you can notice as well is also its softness. Now, remember, we are looking at images over 100 years old, okay. taken with, with equipment which was not uh, as fine-tuned as, as what we use today. And one of the things which, ma which many people might not realize is that er early lenses were rather soft, were rather soft, and particularly at the edges. So they gave you that natural soft feel in the, in the actual image. And this, this picture shows it. You can also see that it's just one light what i call i am sure that this light is coming not from a studio light or a, or a, or a lamp 
99% is coming from either a window or a doorway. Okay, so it's very simple lighting. And this, this simple type of lighting can be done today. I consider window lighting to be one of the most easiest and most attractive types of lighting. Let's move on to a different image. For example, this is a, wherever I, I could, I try to put in the date and the and the author of the image, but sometimes you will notice that I, I couldn't find the, the, the author or the date, but that's few and far between. For example, this is done um, a day in London in 1896, and what makes this picture sort of have stopping power? It's made me look at it. For example, we're talking about 1896, so photography had only been invented around 40 years before. Uh, as most of you know, it was invented in 1839, and in Malta it appeared 1840. Okay, what attracts me to this picture is the central subject, which is so obvious, which is the the carriage, the horse, and the, and the driver, and then all the rest, the atmosphere is um, like misty, diffused. It's I, I guess it's a particularly uh, normal London rainy day, uh, and the author has managed to come out with with uh, for me what is a, an image which has stopping power and attraction. It definitely um, works on the subject being totally in the center, so your eyes go through it. Today we use this a lot in Photoshop, what we call a vignette where we've got our our main subject in the middle and if we've got things which are distracting we usually do this effect like a soft focus effect or darken it a lot so that we put a sort of spotlight on our main subject what what the author is doing here is unmistakably he's driving our eyes to what he wants us to see all the rest is uh, like a, a frame. It's the, con the il contorn, we say in, in Maltese. It's the, the, the other things which are enhancing the main subject, but not fighting for attention of the main subject. Something totally different. Now, this is before the previous image, 1867. So here, um, photography had really been only invented about 30 years, but you can see the smoothness and quality of what is the original naturally was a sepia toned print. Uh, again, here I, I would criticize slightly the photographer, but maybe it is the reproduction that is wrong, but I would not have cut off the reflection. We always think reflection should be and uh, shouldn't be cut off. It should be fully inside the picture. He could have easily cut off a bit from the from above and included more from the from the from the bottom. Again, as you can see, this is a very centrally situated subject. We can't really not look anywhere before we've seen the figure of this woman. OK, our eyes, everything works to drive us to the central part, the important part of the image. OK, and then we have this what I, what I would call a secondary subject, but it's not the, the tones of it because it's all in the gray and stuff like that. It's not really fighting for attention with the woman. What makes actually the picture as well is the headdress. I don't know what she's wearing. It's like a, a cloth bonnet, but the white headdress says it all. Now, I would never know if this picture was contrived or if the author found it, but what I can say is that the elements uh, of the subject and also the background and the atmosphere, again, is really done well. Because you, you can't not look at this picture. And I mean, I can, I can still even see this picture in my house hanging on a wall and I wouldn't get very much bored with it, I'm sure. Everything is really nicely positioned. So again, uh, we're talking 1867, which is a very early, early year. Now, those who have researched and, and uh, read about uh, great photographers before, we know that Alfred Stiglitz 
was American and he is uh, an icon in particular in American photography, but also in international photography. Uh, Stiglitz managed to lift up photography from a document, a, a record shot or a simple portrait to something else, to, to mainly art. Okay, if we, if we study his photographs, you will see one thing in common in all the pictures. They are well thought out. There is thinking behind each image. Uh, he is not snapping away. He is in putting his, his, his ideas, his compositional sense, the way he manages the subject. And here all that is coming in. Again, a very central subject. But notice again one thing. It's just the subject which is important. The rest is just there to fill in the rest of the frame and to, uh, to enhance the main subject. And it, it, this image also tells a story. I mean, whoever sees this picture can tell a different story. Maybe the girl is just dreaming or, or else she's tired after a day's work or else she's just lazing about. We don't know. But one can read um, any type of story, a lot of types of stories, depending from where one stands. OK, this image again is, as you say, it's an 1890 picture. Um, I'm sorry, this picture is not very sharp because it's taken a reproduction from a book. And it's by one of the, the photographers I admire a lot, uh, Le Leonard Missonet. He was a Belgian photographer. Uh, in the early days, not actually in the early days, in the, in the from ESO 1880 till 1920, um, the strength of Belgian, French, and even East European photographers with black and white was, was very much felt. Uh, this guy, I do um, give you the advice to write down his name and study and, and look at his photographs. Very classical, very lyrical. His photographs are like paintings, um, but they have that little bit more because we know that this, the, these, uh, we are looking a bit at reality. The persons in the picture really existed. The places in the images really existed. I like also Misson's work because he likes one uh, to use a lot backlight in his photograph. So the, most of his pictures are shot against the sun and you get that nice halo and also shadows, which I think add mystery to the picture and beauty as well. Um, I'm sure you have all known about know about the rule of thirds t-h-i-r-d-s okay so i'm not mistaken <laughs> uh, where here the woman is definitely the main subject she's on a strong point and the two children over here are balancing that the figure as a secondary um a secondary subject but again they are not fighting for attention we know that we have to look here our eyes instinctively grow, go there. Then we start studying more the picture. I, I love the way the, the water is, is, is pointing towards the main subject. And then again, the misty feel and the atmosphere of the image. It's a picture which has mood. Uh, again, this is another Misson port of picture. Uh, and you can see what I, what, what I mean, that here one can see the input of the photographer. Okay, where he's turned an industrial subject, which is a train train line or a train station, into something much more mystical. He's used, uh, he's darkened more or less uh, the, 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 the main area of the image so that anything which was black went, black, went blacker. And again, we have this fabulous leading, leading us out to this central part, which I think makes the image. Here, he's left uh, a, a, the figure of a person and the train is over here. I don't agree with this guy here. 
I would have cut him off, but naturally anybody can, any picture we can see, we can talk about uh, about things which, which I wouldn't uh, put there. But that's my only comment on this. But I love what's happening here. It's very important sometimes to put a figure in an image so that one can see, uh, can be able to gauge and know the scale of what is in the picture. So we know that these things are very big, rather, rather huge. OK, and this train, this train, we know the size of it according uh, in relation with a, with a human being. So that gives a bit more information. The fact that the, the image is also black is in silhouette, I think also adds mystery to, to the picture. Another picture by Misson, and here you can see. I, I mean, this would be a, a beautiful painting. And here you again see his use of uh, of backlight. And the use of, of shadow and silhouette. Something totally different, and here we see an 1880 uh, Chirka image. Of a pass in China. Um, one of the, the areas of the, the great uh, the Great Wall of China. Um, OK, this does not feel creative as the ones before, so one can can see. But again, we have a lot of detail here. What impresses me when I'm considering that it's an 1880 image is the quality and the detail in the image. And also the way um, the Great Wall sort of draws us in from from the right hand into this area where we stop and look and then takes us away, giving us the indication that there's much more that we can explore in that area. Uh, Henry Peach Robinson was a was an, an English photographer. This picture is iconic of his. It's 1902. It's an image where he tries to replicate uh, the artworks, for example, of uh, Rembrandt, uh, Vermeer, and, and the, great, the, great, the great masters. This is not a snapshot. This is not something he found. This is something he set up. All right, and this brings me to the, to the point, um, the argument, which I always, a lot of times I always state, that a picture is not found but is made. Here the author shows us how meticulous he is, how he's chosen the right props, how he's chosen the right lighting, the positioning of his subjects. Again, who is the main subject? It's the woman and the child because the way the light hits her, she's the brightest area of the image. Again, rule of thirds. Okay. Um, the secondary subject, which is the guy, the guy here, is much more uh, less lit up than the woman. So, although he's quite an important part of the image, he does not contest the importance of the, the, the woman and the child. Here again, you can see, because sometimes I've got, I, I have students or people starting into photography and they say, um, I don't have studio lighting, I don't have the right equipment, I don't have this or that. Here we're seeing that this image is done just by one, by natural light coming in from the window and also very good dark room printing because I am sure that the author has, uh, has uh, reduced the exposure over here to get this light out and has also darkened these areas as well to make the image much more uh, important in the central part. I quite like the flowers, although sometimes I'm in, I'm not in, not so sure, but this is a matter of interpretation. I'm sure that if I hear you, we can talk afterwards, after we finish, you can come out with your comments. I might have removed some of the plants because this plant is rather, the, the light is hitting it quite strongly. And I think it might um, reduce the importance of of the woman and the, the child. But that is just a thought that passes through my mind. Uh, Arthur Cales was an American 
photographer mainly who was he was concerned with pictorialism if he was when we are saying that a, victor, a photographer is pictorialist his main aim would not be commercial or documentary he would try to do sort of artistic different images and this picture uh, demonstrates what he does what he used to do sorry he's dead now in 1936 in fact he died uh, and his, his photographs are quite uh, different than others because he uses a lot the shadows, he uses a lot um, silhouettes. And when you're using silhouettes and shadows, one has to be a bit of a master of form. You see if the form <coughs> of the form becomes very much important because you've got no detail. Again, um, Am I am I uh, in agreement with him by cutting off these people from there? No, I would have preferred these people not to be here and these shadows not to be here. So again, we're seeing that photographers before us also had these problems. I'm sure this picture is not set up now. This was taken during some show or other where, where the author did not have full control over what uh, what what his image would be. But again, I love the movement and the form of it. Uh, this is a photograph. I've put him in uh, Oscar Gustav Rylander because he is reputably uh, one of the first photographers who manipulated images in the dark. If you manipulated not by burning or dodging, by, by, by adding more light or reducing, but he would cut out, paste, re-photograph, He's considered sort of the, uh, the the father of composite photography. Uh, this image is called chagrin, which means in French um, sadness. Uh, and, and again, you can see that it's not a, an image which he found. It's an image which the author saw in his mind's eye and prepared everything in order to bring out uh, this sort of picture. I, I do suggest again to take note of this, this photographer and look at his work, particularly his composite images. When we say composite, he, he, he would take three or even, even eight or nine different photographs and compose a single, a single picture from all those photographs by cutting, by uh, pasting, I mean, it's what we do today so easily with Photoshop, but you can imagine in 1864, it was not even easy to to do a picture, let alone play around in, the, in this way that I'm that I'm saying. So again, uh, Rylander is, um, if I'm not mistaken, he was Swedish, this photographer. Uh, a different image by Consuelo Kanaga. Kanaga was a um, Japanese photographer living in America. And here we see a picture of, it's, an, it's a nature picture, but again, much different than we would actually um, observe. Here, the, the photographer has seen the image, has seen the way the light is hitting again against the light, what, what the, the French call Contre jour. When we are using backlight, the French call it contre, C O N T R E, dash jour, J O U R. So it's a, it's a different type of image. Again, using backlight to its to its best possibilities. And again, using shadows. I I, I rather consider that we in Malta, particularly, we do not really exploit much shadows and silhouettes we should try and look more at things in silhouette and in shadows and think in that way because as soon as you do something silhouetted or in shadow you are going um away from reality although a shadow and a silhouette is still real but the lack of information that these pictures give us make them sometimes much more interesting intriguing and actually mysterious. 
Unfortunately, I don't know the, the author of this picture, but uh, I, I quite love it. Uh, we're, we're talking just around the First World War, 1970. And it's an image of two children, how they should be portrayed, actually. <coughs> As children, doing something, not posing. Okay, I'm sure 99% this, this picture was posed, but it's been done so naturally, and again with minimal light. Are you noticing it? the light that is lit, lighting up this picture is just from a doorway? Uh, unfortunately, in today's world, we seem to be very much fixated on getting detail in every part of the image. But sometimes the less detail, the more intriguing the picture is, the more a viewer is going to look into it. Because when we spoon feed our viewers, we are not really doing them uh, a favor. We should leave things to the imagination. We should leave out information purposely so that we get our, our, um, our viewers to think, to, to integrate into the picture and try and use their own minds instead of giving them everything for granted, spoon feeding becomes boring. <coughs> A contemporary image of that same period. Again, it looks natural, but I am sure it's posed, it's contrived, but I love, if you see the composition in this image, it's, it's fantastic, you know? I mean, all around the figures, it's more or less dark. So it's the important area is this area here. Then you have this fantastic triangular composition of the three women, all dressed in light clothes. I am sure that this was not something that he found. It's, it's, a, it's an image which was constructed by, by, by the author. And then we also see the two children, which here again, um, one might not agree or one might agree, because in my opinion, I think they're a bit extra. If I would have been preparing this picture, I guess I would have sent the kids home. <laughs> so uh, to, to, to make the three figures in the middle that much more important. But again, I love this, the, the way this image has been, has been done. Uh, 1920s now, we're getting a bit further from, from the beginning of photography. Again, look at this image. For example, we see a lot of pictures in fashion, in modeling, etc., etc. Here, the author, and we're talking 1920s, she has been um, bold enough to hide half of the face of the model, actually. But what does this picture give? It gives us a mood, it gives us a feeling. It wants us to search and think what what that that young woman was thinking. Why was she there? What was she said? Was she having a great problem in life? It gets you thinking. And that is part of the story of a good photographer. A good picture really needs to tell something to the viewer. And if a picture, particular picture gets 10 different versions of what, what that picture is saying, the more the better, because it's it's making you think. It's giving you, um, stimulating the brain. Here is a classic. Again, can you see what's what, I mean, this is maybe my preferences, but what I like, the shadows, the silhouettes against the light, the arch which is framing the figures, the bridge at the back, which is closing you in, more or less, to look down. Fantastic image. We're talking 1937 in Paris. <coughs> uh, here we come to another, for me, uh, an, another uh, a great, great photographer who is Brassai. He was uh, Hungarian, but was living in France. He had emigrated to France. He was actually a sculptor and a writer and filmmaker. So, a tutto fare. Uh, one of the numerous artists who were in, in Paris between the two world wars. 
Now here we see a picture which is does not have any people in it, but look at the light. Look at the continuation leading you there into the unknown where there's the mist. OK. Nice. All, all right. Today, if I would do this picture, I would straighten it with Photoshop. But remember, at that time, they had nothing. So, but what, what's made this picture? I, I am sure that if anybody of us with a basic camera and lens saw this picture and were there at the time, we would have shot the same picture because it does not need particular equipment. In fact, all the pictures I'm showing you till now do, don't need that, any, any particular equipment. All they need is, is good eyes and a good brain. Um, a picture which is nearly um, not sharp enough or whatever. But remember, again, the quality of the lenses. Those types of lenses had their own appeal because they would give you this softness. OK, and uh, again, look at this picture. Just two persons, main subject. Here, I'm, I'm not sure if the main subject is this girl or that girl because they actually do fight a bit for attention. But a simple picture scene. I, I don't think it was found. It was constructed again. And it's a picture in 1905. Uh, Victorian era. I have no information on this image, but it attracted my, my attention due to the, its quality, uh, the quality of this picture, the, the picture. And again, this simple lighting uh, that is coming just from an aperture, from a window. And again, backlight. That beautiful backlight. A postcard in 1912. Here, the photographer is being a bit more adventurous. Remember the, the, the times that this picture has been shot. Okay. It's a different image than what, shot, what was shot before. Again, the, the author was bold enough to hide the, the faces of the, of the models or call them what they are. I mean, I'm sure this is a, a made up image, but it works. It gives you the idea of uh, being by the sea, enjoying a holiday, etc. And the way he's also composed the three people is the best way he could have done it. As time went by, there was more experimentation. And this, for example, is uh, a picture by Thiebault, who was a, a French photographer in 1863 of the magician Henri Robin. Uh, and here you can imagine that the, 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 the creativity of, of the, the photographer and also the use of the double exposure technique on equipment which was on 1863. <laughs> Remember, this is you have to really know how to use the cameras they had at that time and the glass plates. We're talking about glass plates here. No viewfinder, no, 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 nothing. So you really have to know where to position the the two, the, where the, 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 the ghost and, and the, the, the magician in order to get them uh, at the same place. Um, the props over here, we can also see a, another picture here, most probably, again, of the same Robin. Um, another picture which pulled me to it, a simple image, which everybody can actually do, and the light here is just coming from a lamp, from a, an oil, oil or gas, I think oil, oil lamp. Yeah, with, with, the, with the girl just just resting resting or sleeping like she's uh, I don't know if it's a true shot or not I think it's contrived it's made up but it has nothing I have nothing against making images to to pass on a message or or a mood or a feeling and this image does have the mood and you can say the girl was was reading before going to sleep and this happens to most of us when reading in bed she's just gone peacefully to sleep the image exudes peace and tranquility, in fact, and even the subdued tones of the of the picture. 
I'm sure that most of you have seen this image, particularly those who troll the internet and research on old pictures. Uh, this is not a contrived image, it's actually an image where uh, the lady photographer is actually risking her neck shooting over there. Again, can you see that the use of the use of the sort of silhouette? Because you can hardly say who she is. But that's not important. She's outlined against the author did not make the, the mistake of going further up and shooting from up down and getting the photographer, the, the girl, the subject outlined by this busy background. No, he went down to get her outlined against the sky so that he got the silhouette, the form of the silhouette more than right. Again, the atmosphere uh, reminds you of the industrial age of smog or mist. It could have been mist as well. But again, it, it, it brings out the main subject. Uh, again, Brassai, the, the French, the Hungarian French photographer. Fantastic image. If I'm not mistaken, it's Central Station in New York, this, but I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, the particular light there that is coming from there, from the windows. Uh, we've seen a lot of pictures like this. Uh, it's, it's again an image which is done with natural light again. And it, be, it becomes like a, a futuristic type of picture, actually. I keep looking at this image and I, I don't want to really take away my eyes from it. Now, an image which definitely was not easy to do up, up in the mountainous and this range in Peru. I think it's in Peru, I'm not so sure, or Mexico or Peru, I think. Um, and here you see a group of uh, explorers, I don't know, um, posing for a shot in the in the majestic mountains of, of, of the area. Again, a very nice picture, giving you a story, giving you the characters. And well shot against a backdrop that indicates what the people were actually doing. Another image which I don't know the author of, uh, Autumn in the Netherlands. I have a feeling that uh, the, there is a bit of input by the photographer and the way the people and the props are, are posed, but it still looks natural and really fantastic. Again, another sepia toned image with atmosphere. Uh, here we go up to another American photographer, but actually Clarence H. White is a is a very important personality in photography because he was one of the first people in America who started teaching photography in schools and universities. So again, quite an important figure in the history of photography. For photography. Here we have a picture by him, which is called the or Orchard, and we have um, a little bit of a simple story where the three girls are picking something, I mean, like apples or I guess. Um, and again, simple, but I think effective. This was a picture which is totally different from what I've showed you. In fact, it's um, the mascot of HMS Barre, which was uh, a, a, a British battleship in 1915. <laughs> And here the, the photographer has actually done um, a postcard, I guess, to sell to the to the uh, sailors. And I, I guess he made quite a quite a good penny. Here one sees the ingenuity of the photographer to come out with something which is uh, likable to those who know the cat or the or the ship. OK, we know that it's a postcard because it's actually also numbered here uh, and the copyright of the, of the guy. They usually used to number these pictures in order for for so if somebody wants a, wants a reprint or a picture of that, they would just go to the photographer, mention the number and he would know straight away what picture they would want printed. 
But here again, very, very central composition and telling a bit of a story with a little humor um, being introduced by the cat. A totally different picture shot in Peru, in Cusco. I, I quite love this image because you've got all this tension going up to raise that cross uh, during some, some religious event in Peru. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a bit, um, I can't enlarge the image, but there are, there are some of the, of the people inside the picture who are aware of the photograph, they're actually posing. I love the way there was wind and the, the, the flags are in movement, not they're a bit blurred, but you still know that they're flags. It's, it's a fantastic, for me, it's a fantastic picture. Daytona Beach in America, showing the bathers early, early on in the turn of the century, uh, who used to go, you know, for their, for their relaxation on this beautiful beach, which is still very popular till this day. Um, I like the way that, for example, that these two persons were kept in the image to sort of give a base to the picture. Otherwise, everything would be, um, if this they weren't here, there would be just too much empty space. Uh, notice as well from where the, the image, the horizon is lying. He's, the photographer has filled in more than three quarters of the image with the people and the figures and just left a bit of sky, just to indicate depth. Why? Because the sky is not interesting, it's plain. So when we have a plain sky, usually we include less and less of it. This is an image which I liked because it's fun. And when you're showing something which is fun, and a bit of maybe a bit of humor, that is always a winning, um, a winning ingredient in a picture taken in 1927, as you can see. It's not a it's a post picture because they know that the picture is being taken, but I love the way um, that it tells a story of, of that society of that time, of these two ladies at that time, young, young women who are really enjoying and having fun. Again, notice that the photographer snapped his picture while they were outlined against the sky, not down here. One instant afterwards, he would have lost the picture. Maybe he shot more than one, I don't know. But the one which works is where they are outlined against a plain background. And that's something I always try to tell students to look for, or photographers to look for. Always try and outline your subjects against plain, unobtrusive backgrounds. Uh, 1919, we're back. The Garden magazine was a, an early mag British magazine, which, which had to do with, with, with flowers, shrubs and, and gardening. Uh, here, the author named it Swan Lake. And again, it is a picture which has been set up because we know that these girls aren't dressed like that. Normally, he's given them also props. And I, again, here, um, at least the, the author has not cut the reflection, but has managed to keep all the reflection in. What makes also the picture is this one. All right, so that gives another dimension to the image. It's not just two girls posing as like nymphs. Uh, uh, but there's also the interaction of this one. Uh, Edward Steichen was actually one of the photographers in the same period of Alfred Stieglitz that we that we, 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 we mentioned before. And he was very, very creative in my opinion because he, he started shooting subjects and taking subjects which normally nobody was doing before. For example, if you look at this this type of portrait, because it is actually a portrait as well. Remember, a portrait does not have to be just the head and shoulders. It can be the whole picture, the whole figure of a, of a person. Uh, here, in fact, it would be an environmental or ambiental portrait. Uh, the way he's used the, the model, 
and again the shadows of the iron bars and the the black and white stairs leaving the dark one of the dark stairs at the bottom again to give base to the picture and again here this type the type of lighting used this would be not natural lighting this would be some uh, some floodlight because we can see from the very harsh shadows that that, that are here but he he made this type of lighting to create a feeling of uh, fear in the actual model I'm not so sure what he thought, what he was saying about this vase, because I think I would have taken it away and put something either more more sinister. I don't think it it matches, but I I love what's happening here. Uh, 1917 image. Look at the way the author has composed the picture. Again, this is not found. It's he set it up. I'm sure he had to you know, get the, this guy with the camel to pose there for him. And it's it's an, another fantastic image shot very early on in, 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 in photography. Where you've got uh, the camel and this guy dressed in light, the lightest areas. Our eyes go there right away. Then they are balanced on the on the the diagonal third with the palm trees. <coughs> and then we have the pyramid over there given, giving us the, the triangular uh, composition as well. Remember that it is, it is scientifically proven that people like to see triangular compositions. So I guess even early, early on, photographers were aware of this thing. Picture taken in China. Again showing now here. This is a, a very early, I would say, street fo street photograph. It's taken by Arnold Gente. He was again um, an immigrant from in, 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 an American immigrant. And he, he, he used to take a lot of pictures in Chinatown. This is actually Chinatown, not China. And here we have a street picture which shows which which really shows the spirit of street photography, where you're trying to, where we are photographing things with, without setting them up, without making an impact on them, just searching for the right instant where the shot and something is happened. There's a bit of tension with something happening here, where the woman is doing something here, and uh, these two are totally looking down at the image. Again, you can see that you've got a lot of dark areas surrounding the main subject, which is the guy in a, in a bright top and the two baskets. Uh, an image which has always intrigued me. I, I, I quite like uh, to see war photography, to be honest. Um, I don't like war naturally, but I like to see war, fo war photographs because there is a story, an automatic story here. Here is the, the Italians during World War One. The, the Italians and the Austrians and Germans had a very tough um, area to fight. It was in the mountains where you had to contend against the mountainous landscape, the cold of, of winter. And here we see <laughs> we see them um, raising up uh, a cannon and also with it a dog and, and other other ammunition, I, I would guess. A fantastic picture taken at the right time and at the right instant. With the cannon nicely, nicely outlined against the sky again. Uh, Ike Meyer Jr. is another American pictorialist. Uh, his photographs again are worth trying to see. Now look at this again, this picture, which is which is set up. I'm sure it's set up, but it works. It's it's normal. It's obvious. Um, the girl is dressed in a very bright white and that little white handkerchief there and white piece of drape down here gives a nice triangular feel to that. Again, the dramatic lighting coming just from one side. I would guess another 
uh, another door or window that does that, and then I, the expression of sort of either fear or surprise that she's been caught by her parents rummaging through the through the drawers. Uh, it, it's again the interpretation can be different of this picture, but it's it's an image again which you cannot just ignore or just go through. You have to look at it and look at it in depth, and you keep looking at it uh, and liking it. Now, why can't we make pictures like that? Sometimes in Malta, we, we rarely see these type of pictures. I mean, today it's not. I don't want to criticize or anything, but. The, the majority of images we are seeing are landscapes with a, with slow exposure. I think this is the bulk and vast majority of images we are seeing. Can't we try looking more inwards at our own what's happening in our own home, our own family, our own kids, particularly in these periods when we are stuck in at home? Let's try and come out with something much more creative and meaningful. Sorry about the rent, but sometimes I have to do it. Uh, again, by Rudolf Eichmeier, the same photographer. Look at the light, the pose, the feeling in this picture. You, you, you just, I, I, I don't even want to talk about it because it's, for me, it's sublime. Those people like, for example, Peter Bartolomarnis, who's with us today, who remember the work of Joe Vella. This reminds me a lot of his, his actual work. Not as contrasty, a bit softer, but it reminds me of, of his work. Um, fantastic image. I mean, I, I wish I would have done it myself. And we are talking 1900s here, 1890, 18, 1900. Simple cameras. <coughs> same, same author, different subject. Again, a post picture, but look at the composition. It gives me a feeling of the works, for example, of Manet, the, the, French, the famous French painter. Um, there's a diagonal feel in this picture going all throughout. The girl dressed in white. So that one can't not start looking at the picture from here. And then this pole acts as a sort of uh, lead in to, to the, the, the male operating the boat. Nice subject around nature, etc, etc. Does it need anything else? No. Uh, in fact, uh, this is part of the same picture cut off. And uh, again, another image which is rather similar. Very nicely Victorian. Um, simple. Here we go again into the Create very creative uh, element or, or realm. A picture of Mary Pickford, who was uh, one of the silent film stars, American film stars, very famous. And here it's all naturally contrived in a studio where, in some way, they've created this type of stars uh, in the background. I love the lighting coming on from the back again, backlight, nice halo all around, fantastic work. Um, let's talk a bit about the portrait now. And again, here you see the situation where the author is using just the silhouette. Okay, I'll always remember one of my early wedding pictures where I was very happy shooting as a silhouette similar of the bride, a silhouette of, of her very similar to this picture. And uh, when I showed it to the bride, she told me, ah, Mala, your flesh didn't go off. And I was thinking that she would say, wow, well, what an artistic portrait this is. But again, it depends on who is seeing the picture. Now we're going a bit backwards. This is an 1850 daguerreotype. It was, the daguerreotype is considered to be the first sort of commercially viable stable photograph that was invented. So this is just, 11 years after the invention of photography, but you can see the beauty and the quality of the daguerreotype. Um, the daguerreotype quasi, it was for a long number of years unsurpassed in quality. So the question might be, why was it discontinued? Because it was a very, very laborious 
technical process to produce just one image. It didn't have a negative, so you, if you wanted two pictures of that lady, you would have to shoot two pictures, one after the other. And the, it was extremely labor intensive with chemicals, which were actually even dangerous for health. Uh, I love the enigmatic look of the, 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 the woman, the, the way she is dressed. One can start thinking that she's a very young widow, maybe, or if one needs to come up with a story, but that's the feeling it gives me. And her eyes are so beautiful and face that they, they revit you to that area. Nothing else is contrasting, beautiful. Uh, a self-portrait by another photographer here, he displayed himself looking at a glass plate of himself as well. So here is what, an, an early sort of selfie, if you can, we can call it that. One light source coming from one side and also a bit backlit as well. It's not coming, all right, it's more side lighting, but sometimes it's hitting things in a, in a backlight manner. Plain background, dark, dark base to give the picture base. I mean, these things were, we, if we don't look at what was done before, one can here appreciate that what, what we're doing today and what is enjoyed and liked to this day are the same things that authors, that, that photographers did at great pain because the technology wasn't there, but the, what they did 100 years before us without having all the gizmos which we today associate photography with. Um, this one, I just put it in because I like the interaction that the, the, the picture was done in, where, where you can easily see that uh, he's her grandfather and the girl is really enjoying herself playing, playing up to the camera and playing with who, who seems a very good natured grandfather. Uh, another picture which is, which draws a lot from the Greek style of sculptures, etc. Because even the photographers who came before us learned from other artists and photographers which came before them. Which gets me to the argument that you cannot ignore what has been done before. You cannot become a great photographer or somebody who is doing important pictures without coming with a st study of what has gone before our time, what others have done. And it can be a sculptor, it can be a painter, it, that, it can be a photographer that we take inspiration from. It's important we research, we look at this, at, at, at other people, what they've done. Another image by Ike Meyer, who I showed you a couple of images before, again, uh, simple, it's a play upon the the sleeping type of, of model. Naturally, everything is contrived because I think it would be rather uncomfortable to sleep on that on that path there. Uh, and she's dressed in a kimono, which is not, is, is actually a, like uh, very definitely Japanese or Chinese. But again, I love the feel of the image, the darkness. And then that light, that light and interaction of the model's soft face, the contrast with the harsh, um, aggressive look of, of the, the, dead bell, the dead bear. So here we've got contrasts which actually do work in the image. Another happy picture, fun. Definitely posed, it's in America, it was done in America, but I don't know the photographer. And again, um, it, it's a it's a pleasing image. You can't really you you feel like as if you want to know these these two girls who are who look so so you know um, easy to get along with, uh, sympathetic, sympathetic, etc. etc. Showing us the the apples of the, of the farm, and you can see the main trick is that dressing them in light clothes and all the rest is dark. So they really stand out of the picture. Uh, anyway, a strange image, you might say, why did I put this in? 
uh, because just to show that although technically this portrait is very, very, very good te technical wise, the photographer wasn't so sure about how to pose a person. Because when you've got somebody with ears jutting out like that, you should never, never shoot him directly in front because the ears come out much, much bigger. It's much better if the author had told the, this, this poor guy to look a bit to the side so that this ear would be hidden and this ear would go become part of his face. So again, showing that um, photographers before us also did mistakes. Uh, here we come a bit to look at a, um, an, an, a color image for a lot of people think that color was invented in the mid 50s. It wasn't, it was already being marketed a, a type of color picture uh, from 1907. It was, they were called autochromes. Uh, again, it was a very difficult and laborious type of process. Uh, but there is, in fact, I, I don't think no, if I remember him, but there is a very important Russian photographer who was a master at these autochromes. If you if you if you Google in autochrome and uh, Russian photographer, I'm sure he'll come up. Again, I would suggest you study him. But look at the the tones of this image, where the author has not used glaring color, he's used was a, you would call this a monochrome. The mood it has is fantastic. Uh, she is in the center again, she is the, the, the center of attention. Uh, the props are pointing and framing towards her as is the, the actual window. This is also an autochrome by Arnold Gant, we, who, who we, saw, we saw one of his pictures. Look at the beauty, it, it had a, a beautiful feel. The autochrome, this has been done circa 1913. Um, an image which where, where uh, there was invented back projection. Back projection was they used to project uh, another image on the background and then you've got the main person or this object being photographed with with light in front of this back projected image. That is why you get this feeling like as if she's cut out and pasted on, on that, because you would never get that type of picture. Uh, Gertrude Kassebier is a photographer, American, who had a very, very long career. She, she, did, she died few years, uh, not, not so much time ago, to be honest. She lived to a, to a very ripe age and was still photographing at a very ripe age. Again, her pictures ha are full of feeling. As is, look, you can look, I mean, the picture is self-explanatory. Uh, this is a self-portrait of the actual uh, photographer. Right, and you can see uh, uh, not only her, her actual natural beauty, but the way she's portrayed herself. For me, it's a fantastic self-portrait. And we are, we are talking 1890, this picture, I would say, very, very early on. Where would we be, for example, without pictures taken by the early photographers showing us um, the, the American Indians and, and other, other races where we would have never seen really a photograph of them, just paintings which could have been manipulated. It's fascinating. Uh, there's a lot of photography on the American Indians and also the American Civil War. Imogen Cunningham, another famous photographer. Uh, and here you can see. I mean, this this portrait reminds me of Michelangelo's Pietà. I, I, I think it's a fantastic moody picture. All soft, all the light coming in like it's a divine light on, 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 the, on the, 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 the woman. I can't say more. I mean, fantastic, simple when, when you see the actual picture, how it's been taken what the elements were, it's rather simple. 
yet it's so eye-catching. And after all these years, over 100 years have passed and more, it still catches my eye. Uh, another portrait, much more towards our, our time, by Man Ray, who you know was a very famous American photographer. The portrait is of Model Lee Miller, the American model, who actually eventually turned to become a photographer herself in her later years and was rather successful. Again, I like the simplicity of this portrait. A creative image. All I know is that the, the picture was named Madame Agnes. I don't know who took it, but the idea is not, it's the idea which makes the picture, not the equipment or, or the props or the model, it's the idea where the, the photographer has just played around with part of the transparent dress uh, that the model is wearing. 1920, again, another image. These are portraits, are considered portraits, but can you see that there's that little bit extra? It's not just a person posing. There's a lot of input by, by the photographer himself. Um, Adolf de Meyer was, was Vogue's first fashion photographer. And again, you can see why, because of the mystery of the, the actual images. Uh, when I see today's portraits, particularly what we're doing on the island, I see uh, the overuse sometimes a lot of, of too many lights in our portraits. I, I, my suggestion is to go back to using just one light and maybe one reflector and playing around with those. And you will be amazed at the effects you can get and the moods you can get and the atmosphere you get you can get out of out of your pictures with just a simple light. Even it can be a tungsten lamp or something, an LED lamp, and maybe a piece of cardboard to reflect back some some uh, some light into the shadows. Overlighting a subject, you are removing, you are killing a lot of the atmosphere, a lot of the mystery of the picture. This is also an autochrome, a Russian postcard. Look at the beauty of 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 the old vintage images. Um, where again you have the softness, the type of frame. Okay, you would say today, today we would say no, this frame is over, done, it's taking over the main picture. But still, to be honest, although the frame is very elaborate, the red and white, which are two colors which pull our eyes towards towards them, and the, the pose of the, the good looking little girl there, uh, still pulls you towards the main subject, which is which is actually the center. Again, another image by Ekmeyer. Again, it's a portrait. Same author. I like. I like. As as you can notice, I like the work of of Ekmeyer because he he takes a lot of portraits. He likes to work with people, and it's something I've always liked doing. Uh, I love the, the 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 look of the girl, for example. There is so much contact when you keep looking at her eyes and her face. She's she really seems like she's drilling you with her gaze. She's looking right at you. Greta Garbo, you've all heard about her, uh, of her, famous film star, movie star. A portrait by Ghent. And another image, which is a simple, again, portrait. Here, I think the author could have done a bit better. Why? Because my criticism of this image is, although I like the mood, is that the author has thrown too much light on the hands. So your eyes start going on the hands. Maybe that was his idea, because she's a dancer, and we know uh, that hands are very important in dancing. So maybe the author wanted to put the emphasis on the hands. I'm not sure. Again, it's my interpretation. Another image of Greta Carbo, much, much better than the previous one. This is much more artistic. And again, the author is using one light. 
Today you might present this picture and somebody would tell you, ah, but that shadow is too harsh, you know? I mean, sometimes you have to go away from these things because it's the, the, the general feel of the image which should be really looked at. And I think the feel is, is fantastic here. <clears throat> uh, a portrait of George O'Keefe, the, the artist who eventually became the wife of Alfred Stiglitz, done by Stiglitz. Uh, again, very nice soft portrait of, of a person. And we see more of the, the such images, the, the 50s or 60s look. 90, uh, can somebody please switch off the mic? I hear some. Somebody is with his mic switched on. Um, as I said, a lot of authors were were inspired by uh, by Greek statues and the Roman statues, and here is a definite um, attempt by the photographer to come out with the same thing in a picture. As you can see, this is a, also a, a, a painted background. In in the old studios, you would see a lot of these hand painted backgrounds, even by by famous uh, stars, authors, or, or artists. Again, what's the difference between the first one and the other because of the the time period? Naturally, one is 1914, the other 1925, but also the style of the photographer. Here we've, we're meeting again Edward Steichen, the American who was one of the mainstays of the early fashion industry. Again, another shot by Steichen, 1923. A version of the silhouette that we saw before, but this time there's more light put in there, put in. And here we see also the lengths. Um, remember, this is 1913, where camera shutters and uh, were not that fast. Okay, and you to end lights in the studio where usually this studio lighting was done through um, apertures in the roof or or windows, so you did not have the power of really stopping movement. Here we see um, that they've introduced the dog as well, which is what looks, not, not what looks, because Jacqueline Fortson was a, a model of that time. So it's a fashion shot, introducing some more. Look at how nice the background is. Again, hand painted, giving the, the impression very ma made, done very softly, so that the background seems to be much more far, further away from the actual subject. A much more recent picture of, um, she was a United Kingdom mo model, very, very famous uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, a very, uh, this is also an early color photograph, in fact, when, when color became more or less a chemical process which which became much easier to to replicate and use and then there was this big jump from monochrome having the use of color where photographers would start experimenting a lot with color i've got the last few images um, where here the, the photographers are starting just to push the actual boundaries of photography and also maybe of censorship okay remember the time that these pictures were being shot where even going out in a swimsuit on the beach was not allowed the votes for women were not yet there uh, but look at the idea of of this picture and how it's being combined 1920s, everybody likes to see fun in pictures, so try and introduce that little fun and humor. I mean, for me, this picture will never die because it's a, it's a picture which shows an era which has gone and will never come back again. And it shows that even in those, those times where we think that everybody was very straight-laced, 
Victorian, boring maybe. There were people who were enjoying themselves and having fun and breaking the rules. Like we as young people broke the rules and as other youngsters today are breaking the rules. Again, contrived, but look at the ideas. In fact, here is a proof that uh, if you had wore the type of, of, of swimsuit, you would be actually arrested. It's 1920 in America. And again, very contrived picture where, where, where the bike is, not even, is put on a stand even. So uh, that's for me a bit, a bit of a mistake, but I'm sure that if the bike had been put down from this stand, they would have dropped the bike because they were very heavy in those days as well. But you see that um, the, the author starting being a bit different. A very nice portrait again. Um, okay, there's no catch lights in the eyes, but there's an atmosphere, there's a mood, there's a what the French call it, joie de vivre, you feel it, the will to live not live life. It's a picture which for me, that's what it implies. Maybe for others, it would imply something else. Here is a very, very set up image, Victorian. But it was, in fact, this image was used as a very early postcard, you know, um, to get gentlemen to buy the, the, the picture. Uh, Remember, showing off an ankle at that time was also considered very, uh, very daring. So let alone showing somebody with their, their nightgown. Like here as well, a French postcard of, the, of that time. And this is again stretching more the boundaries of the time it was shot. Okay, again, going back to the classic. And this one is the same as well. And that, for example, I, I will end up with this picture, which is really for a very nice picture. Again, the way it's lit up. I'm not sure about this vase here. I would have removed it myself because I like things to be less complicated and less. But I love what's happening on the on the the model. Again, backlight. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this journey back in time. Uh, anybody who'd like to ask any questions can put on their mic. Just put on, yes.